Right, so what I want to argue, I'm going to be a bit provocative and hopefully I won't offend too many people. About 10% of the people is fine, but not too much more than that. I want to argue that the big challenge is we have ahead, which I think people in this room know very well given what you're talking about. So let's just kind of talk about them as inclusive growth. We want growth to be more inclusive, sustainable growth more green, and of course innovation-led, but using that innovation to tackle the kind of missions that we just heard about. And I'm going to come to this whole topic of mission-oriented innovation towards the end. That actually requires us to really engage with the key concept of value and wealth. Where does it come from? I'll remind you that a great book, not just my own, of uh, Piketty on capital, he finished it. You know, it's, it's basically a whole book on inequality, and he finishes it by saying that we need to uh, tax wealth in better ways, in more progressive ways. And what I would argue is that that challenge is actually very hard to do if we keep telling the same stories, which are very narrow stories about where wealth actually comes from. And hence, I always, even yesterday in the two interventions I had, I always begin with Plato because he was a really smart guy. I'm just looking at where the timer is. They told me that there would be a timer so I don't go over. Where did it go? It was here before? Oh, God. Oh, there it is. Okay, then maybe I should stand here. Um, right, that storytellers rule the world. And so what I want to argue is that the stories we are currently telling about, for example, where technology comes from, where entrepreneurship comes from, what we actually mean by partnerships between public and private are part of the problem. And they're actually driving uh, the kind of 1% versus 99% statistics in terms of wealth distribution, but also the disillusionment um, amongst many people about that. And so um, I wrote this book called The Value of Everything to sort of go back also and think about how have economists over the last 400 years of economic theorizing thought about this question. And what's quite striking is that there has been, whether it's Adam Smith or the early economists, the physiocrats who put a lot of emphasis on farm labor, always kind of this distinction about that some parts of society are productive and some are unproductive. And that once you get to, once we, you know, if we have mechanisms that are actually rewarding certain mechanisms which are fueling unproductive activity, or what Adam Smith called rent, so robbery, uh, value extraction, over ones that are actually co-creating the kind of value that we want, then we get big problems. And this is quite interesting to look at how this has been talked about in the history of capitalism. So this guy here, he was uh, the founder of the US's first industrial union, Big Bill Haywood, and he said the barbarous gold barons, they did not find the gold, they did not mine it, they did not mill it, but by some weird magic, all the gold belongs to them. And so this idea that actually there's this work being done, but it's actually not properly being rewarded, is a huge question, I think, in terms of actually tackling this issue of how do we redirect growth, because we shouldn't forget growth has both a rate and a direction, redirect it to actually be uh, creating the kind of society we want, again, inclusive, sustainable, etc. And these stories about wealth creation and value creation are everywhere. Yesterday, I counted how many times I heard the word wealth creators, and it was six. And, and you know, that was just basically the eight conversations I had. So uh, that was quite interesting. And this concept, for example, I mean, of course, some of these quotes are quite old, but Gordon Brown went down quite uh, uh, famously for saying just how important financial services were. Um, in the UK and how we should actually be steering them to create, uh, if you want, even to grow as a percentage of gross value added precisely in a period that, that they were actually growing quite a bit because they were seen as valuable without necessarily questioning what kind of value are they actually creating. Silicon Valley often uses, again, this word wealth creation and Google's uh, a motto, in fact, is don't do evil, so we are doing good, right? We are producing value, we're important. Ring fencing of financial services during Brexit. Uh, prices in the drug industry and the medicine industry, which are often considered too high. The notion that this is actually based on value-based pricing, so these are prices that are somehow rewarding value that's created. I'll come quickly to that if I have time. And then in some ways, the opposite. We often hear about the state in the opposite terms, right? The state at best redistributes value or facilitates the value that's created elsewhere in business. And so what I want to do is question that. Like, how have we come to actually use this word value, and again, even in this community, especially yesterday, uh, this term value and, and wealth creation without necessarily uh, kind of being a thorn in the side of that word and questioning how can we actually change these stories in order to drive like, the kind of growth that we all, in theory, are saying we want. So just really quickly, I'm going to do this in one minute. Um, the, this idea that actually it's not just you know values coming out of anywhere, it's actually coming from particular parts 
of the economy is a really old concept. So the mercantilists in the 1600s focused a lot on trade and exchange rates. This is a period of the Navigation Acts in 1651. Oh, I would argue actually that Trump is bringing us back to this, right? The idea that all you need to do is actually get the terms of trade right and not to get screwed in the process somehow. That's going to create growth. The physiocrats, who were basically the first economists who actually even came up with a spreadsheet to look at growth, if you look at their tableau economique, was very interesting because this was the agricultural area. And they very much, if you read the work of Turgot and Canet, they they thought that all the value actually came from farming. And so we have to steer the economy in such a way to reward that kind of activity more than others. The classical economists, so Adam Smith, David Ricardo, Karl Marx, who were living through the Industrial Revolution, they very much put the emphasis on labor and the factories, the division of labor. You might remember the pin factory example in Adam Smith. So he really looked at technological change, as Marx did himself, um, technological change, division of labor, organizations. And then, and this is what I want to focus on, a huge revolution happened. And I don't know how many of you have taken economics courses or even dabbled in it, but you might hear, know this word neoclassical economics, which is basically modern day economics that we teach worldwide in both undergrad and graduate departments. The, the um, narrative completely reversed, going from sort of the theory of value based on production. And here, let's just ignore the mercantilists for a bit, because they weren't actually looking at production. But surely, the physiocrats looking at farm labor and farm production, agricultural production, and the classicals looking at production in the factory and you know, how industries were actually operating, to one, um, and sorry, and using this also to drive a theory of price, okay, how goods are distributed, the logic got completely reversed. I don't have time to go into details, but just trust me. And I'm very happy to talk to you, to you individually later, give you some good uh, textbook references. But the logic was reversed, right? We had a theory of price. I'm sure you've heard of you know, supply and demand curves, but also more specifically marginal utility theory um, and the notion of competitive prices and all the mathematics behind that, which then actually derived a theory of value. Right? So even what we include, for example, in GDP is what has a price. And then we look at the value that it produces. It, it, it wasn't sort of the opposite way. And what's very interesting is this literally is used also to look at things like wages. So wages for these guys were looked at in terms of the class struggle, the objective conditions of production, the power relationships within uh, factories. And here, wages are looked at, for example, as being related to the preferences, right? This notion that it's about subjective preferences, which are driving supply and demand, uh, preferences for leisure versus work. Okay? And that is very interesting because it also completely changes how we look at things like rent. Rent, not in terms of rent for accommodation, but rent in terms of unproductive activities, in the classical economists were literally in terms of unearned income. Okay? Adam Smith even used the word robbery to talk about the rent extraction that the landlords at the time were um, having. And as soon as you start having a theory of value, which actually begins with a theory of price based on subjective preferences, again, preferences by workers whether to work or not, uh, leisure versus work, it becomes much harder actually to define that production boundary. Okay, who's productive, who's not, because value is actually in the eyes of the beholder, literally. And I think the most striking uh, example of this is that after the crisis, we had Goldman Sachs, uh, the leader of Goldman Sachs actually saying Goldman Sachs workers are the most productive in the world. And what he actually meant by that, he was right. If we look at it in terms of income being earned, and income is, of course, the price of labor, then actually they were the most productive in the world. If it's delinked from what is actually occurring in the economy, literally in terms of the production conditions, division of labor, how different sectors are really interacting to create new value, it perhaps becomes harder to make that claim. So what I want to do is go really quickly over four huge implications of this revolution of having no longer a strong theory of value. And by the way, what I mean by that is a debate about value nested in how we are producing um, in terms of driving prices and hence distribution, because profits, wages, and rents, and interest are actually about how we distribute that value, to one where value is in the eye of the beholder. So the first thing, which is quite interesting, I think most people kind of know this, that GDP becomes a bit tricky. So if you marry your cleaner, um, and I won't say, you know, I'll, I'll make this gender neutral, GDP goes down, right? Because you were actually paying that person something, and now perhaps you're marrying them, uh, sorry, you're marrying them, and they're doing the same work, but no longer paying for it, right? So kind of shocking. Um, if we pollute and then go clean it up, 
GDP goes up, right? So this is the more classical uh, sort of analysis that lots of us do when we teach macro just to get students thinking about what does it mean when we're actually including things in GDP simply because they have a price. But the less common example is what happened actually uh, as finance, financial services started to grow um, in terms of the percentage of gross value added, so the percentage in the economy compared to everything else, so industry and say in agriculture, is that it got really tricky because much of the um, way that this value was being remunerated, for example, through net interest payments, actually wasn't going into GDP. So it's very interesting if you look at the UN's uh, systems of national accounts and how they started to ask themselves, wait, hold on, this is really kind of awkward, they actually use the word awkward, uh, that this part of the economy which is, which is growing abnormally, exponentially, is actually not being included in GDP. They actually had to come up with uh, ex post the value that they were creating. So they said that uh, commercial banks were producing the service of financial intermediation, and investment banks were uh, taking risks, right? So that was actually the service included in the, in the national income and product accounting. Um, and in fact, the cost of financial intermediation then proceeded to drop enormously, but the interest payments didn't. So that also became quite difficult. But this became a huge problem and continues to be a problem in terms of how do we actually measure the value that this particular sector is producing when the, the uh, if you want, it's, it's not nested, if you want, within the theory of how finance is actually nurturing growth in the real economy versus doing what Andy Haldane says in the Bank of England, finance is financing different parts of finance. Corporate governance, many people have critiqued shareholder value objectives within companies as leading to short-termism, which is difficult in terms of actually them producing long-run growth. What's interesting here is that when you actually look at the uh, theory behind shareholder value, so if you read Michael Jensen's work, for example, there's this idea that shareholders are the biggest risk takers. They are the residual claimants. Once everyone else who has a guaranteed rate of return, right, so the state has its guarantee if it perhaps gave a loan to a company, um, we're invested in something, uh, workers have their salary, that's guaranteed, banks have their interest rate. If there's something left over, that's for shareholders. And so this, in fact, has been used to also justify why share buybacks actually are okay in terms of giving money back to these shareholders. Um, and by the way, share buybacks have been increasing exponentially um, in many different sectors. And when you ask these sectors, why are they doing it? They say there's no opportunities for investment. Um, and this is also in areas like uh, uh, energy and in pharmaceuticals, Pfizer is one of the companies that does the most of this. And what's interesting is that um, it's not enough then to actually critique short-termism. What becomes very important is actually to question what is the underlying theory of value, which this idea that everyone else has a guaranteed rate of return comes from when it actually wasn't nested within an understanding of production. So just take the example of the government somehow having a guaranteed rate of return compared to shareholders. I'm sure you in this room know that the government was actually behind uh, some of the most high-risk technology in all your iPhones, internet, GPS, touchscreen, Siri. I mentioned this yesterday, and for each one of those successes, there was actually many failures, right? So there's actually big risk and no guarantee for any of these government investments. Also, workers themselves, when they're taking on a job, today especially, compared to the old um, job structures, they might take a lower wage, initially thinking they have a lifetime career. That itself is a risk, right? But so thinking about risk taking in companies divorced from this understanding of who actually all the actors are and how they're collectively creating value has actually been key to justifying the shareholder value um, uh, dynamic, which, by the way, over time has led to a, a much higher increase in the percentage of cash flow return to shareholders. The CEO to worker compensation ratio in the US has gone out of the roof. I'm sure you know this too. But also one of the key issues is the percentage of business investment actual reinvestment into the economy is falling. And this is, again, something very important, especially in countries like the UK, where the growth that we do have tends to continue to be consumption-led, which is why we have a personal debt to disposable income ratios at record levels. Um, the other thing, very high uh, prices in the pharmaceutical industry is actually a very clear example of this reverse uh, logic from price uh, to value to value to price. So. Um, when the companies were actually critiqued for charging very high prices, even though many of these drugs are, again, publicly financed in the US, the National Institutes of Health spend $32 billion a year on drug research. 75% of new molecular entities 
with priority rating, so the really revolutionary drugs trace the research back to that, they were no longer able to say the pharmaceutical companies that, oh, that's just to recoup our you know, R&D costs, because it was very clear that actually there was this wider collective investment in those drugs that the prices weren't, um, weren't uh, illustrating. So they had to come up with this theory of value-based pricing, which is exactly this idea of value uh, being in the eye of the beholder. The idea is that the prices are actually reflecting the value that you would put to not having that drug. I mean, that's sort of a quick summary of that, um, which is basically infinity. Just think any of you who have children, what you know, the value that you would place basically in their life. But if you look at the history of this value-based pricing, it's absolutely a dysfunctional notion of value. It's, it's quite striking. And Goldman Sachs recently said, you know, actually curing patients is a, is a bad idea anyway in terms of sustainable business models. Very clear. I, I mean, I, I love it when people say this stuff because it becomes very clear where the problem is. I'm going to skip over the platform capitalism bit because I really want to have at least three minutes on the mission stuff. But also this idea that government is unproductive. Again, you know, think of this not as some, um, mm, how do you say, Peter Thiel kind of thing where you know, he, he wants the secessionist movement. He thinks entrepreneurs shouldn't be paying any tax for getting, again, all those um, uh, very productive investments that government has made. But just think of it more generally in terms of how we think of government as being a bunch of inertial bureaucrats. Very important to get the rules of the game right, level the playing field, fix those market failures, but get out of the way then for value to be created in companies. What's actually quite striking is, first of all, that it's simply historically wrong. My previous book kind of documented all the government investments worldwide behind some of the biggest uh, technological changes, but also literally how we calculate GDP doesn't even allow us to look at a government as being productive because we only include the costs. So the cost of the teachers, not the actual value of the education that's produced. And it's very interesting how, how we do the accounting, again, based on prices, doesn't then allow us to actually capture the value that's created uh, by government in different areas. So, what to do? I mean, I just want to say there's a very positive agenda in terms of what to do. The first thing is to admit that value is actually collectively produced. And we can only really map that collective uh, production by, again, nesting it in our understanding of how things are made, how they're distributed, the division of labor, um, et cetera. So going away from the price to value, going back to the value to price, but also make it contested. This, is not, this shouldn't be a clear production boundary. You're good, you're bad. But how can we transform activities, including those in finance, so that they actually are more uh, useful for the capital development of the economy, for innovation and the types of innovation we want. Markets themselves shouldn't be as market forces, seen as market forces that governments intervene in. Markets themselves are actually outcomes of this collective value creation. Carl Polanyi is a great historian on that topic, but it does mean that you shouldn't look at policy just as regulating, but as actively co-shaping and co-creating different areas. And this really puts the policymaker in a different mindset. Um, and you know, in terms of actually then achieving these big ambitions around an economy with more care, a caring economy, a green economy, topics like the circular economy, I think can really learn from how we actually created this value collectively also in the past when it was done explicitly, when we didn't have these kind of ideological uh, 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 problems in terms of how we saw things. So I just want to say that this uh, report, which by the way is free on, oops, sorry, those are my props, uh, free on the web, it's called Mission Oriented Innovation. It's very practical. It's very, um, it's very uh, policy oriented because it was written for the European Commission to actually increase its budget from 80 billion to 100 billion for innovation, but to guide it towards the challenges, the challenges I, met, I talked about before, but to learn from the Moonshot program, which was actually a program where this whole concept of how value is created wasn't uh, under any sort of illusion. To get to the moon and back again in one generation, which was the mission, very concrete, the challenge was something greater, the space race and Sputnik. They required actually to come up with this vision, this dream. It required lots of different sectors to invest, not just aeronautics. It required also um, clothing. You couldn't get to the moon in jeans and a t-shirt. And then lots of bottom-up experiments. And so today when we think about you know, the SDGs, if you just talk about it as challenges or climate change, not much happens. Can we transform it into very concrete missions? Again, policymakers seeing themselves not just as leveling, but actually tilting the playing field in order to achieve these missions, get lots of different sectors to invest, but then use uh, government instruments in terms of the concrete policy instruments to actually drive this bottom-up process, because we know it's not going to work. Uh, top down, right? The Soviet system did not work. We know that. And so this is quite interesting given a, uh, David Attenborough's talk yesterday. If you want to get all the plastic out of the ocean, right, the broader challenge is clean oceans. Get the plastic out over a very concrete time frame. 
concrete percentage you want to get it out. Outline all the different sectors that would be required and use your policy not to pick winners, but also not to do what we tend to do and have done over the last 20 years, which is to overly rely on indirect incentives, tax cuts basically, whether these be reductions in capital gains tax or even R&D uh, tax incentives, but actually Pick the willing. Who's willing? In the private sector, in the public sector, in civil society, where are the organizations actually willing to co-create this value, to tilt the playing field, to steer investment-led growth in order to achieve these particular types of missions? And it, it really does become a collective uh, value creation process, and it's quite striking. Yes, time's up. I'm just going to give you these other two examples. 100 carbon neutral cities by 2030. Um, we sort of outlined what that process would look like. And also, the, um, there was one around dementia, getting uh, patients with Alzheimer's to be completely independent in their homes. What this really requires is lots of different organizations and sectors uh, co-investing. And again, government being willing to see itself, not simply as meddling, not simply as redistributing existing value, but absolutely co-creating that value alongside these different actors. And it becomes a completely different policy lens. And so it's not enough to think about sort of charitable giving or doing good around the SDGs. It absolutely requires going back to how we understand value. And I do think that if we don't care about that, if we don't care about uh, uh, you know, dreaming of a better future in the way, again, that the previous speaker eloquently talked about, then there's actually no point to even talk about value. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marianne. Why don't we uh, take a seat? I'll, I'll cozy up. Actually, we can go. Yeah, why don't you go here? That'd be great. So uh, just a reminder, get on Slido and vote questions, ask questions. We've got a bunch of great ones. Why don't we kick it off with, so hashtag blockchain, i.e. the internet of value to the rescue? Well, blockchains are fascinating because by reducing the intermediary effect, it actually allows us to reduce rent. But that's only if we actually identify certain activities as being about rent. And by rent, I actually think the classical definition was quite useful, unearned income. Some activities just moving things around and getting money for it. That's very different from the neoclassical theory of rent, which is an imperfection towards a notion of a competitive price, which can be competed away. So it's just kind of this transient thing there. Um, going back and actually being able together, because again, I really don't think there should be a blame game, like hedge funds are bad and somehow industry is good. As I just showed you, industry is extremely financialized today. I probably didn't go through that, that slide of the share buybacks enough. But um, I do think that there is a conversation to be had on how we can also use blockchains to track how much of GDP is currently being taken up by rent. Because otherwise, what's currently happening is that those criticizing GDP are talking about things that we should add. So happiness indicators, uh, wellness indicators. Whereas my thing is first just clean up the house, take out the rent, and then we can actually increase it with these more dynamic qualitative indicators. And blockchains could help both the accounting, but also literally the structure and the economy to reduce these intermediary activities which are just taking up room. Wonderful. Um, next one that's been voted up here is, uh, uh, what are your thoughts on eco-economic models? Uh, should we be valuing the ecosystem? What rules should be put in place to minimize unintended consequences? Hmm. So there's lots of work, of course, by env environmental economists on this topic. My contribution to this debate, I think, is that when we use the word ecosystem, and basically everyone does, that's another word I think I counted yesterday, I heard 13 times, we should be very specific what we mean. So if you talk to a biologist, um, they wouldn't just use the word partnership or ecosystem. They would identify, are we talking about a symbiotic one? mutualistic one, a predator-prey one, a parasitic ecosystem. And in some ways, my argument is that currently, we are, because we are not able to really track uh, this kind of co-creation process, and we've allowed some, you know, many activities to, for example, I'll, I'll be a bit provocative here, the venture capitalists who get 20%, right, often of the investments they're making, they often come in um, 20 to 25 years after. Uh, the investments were actually made in terms of the really high risk early stage investments made in particular sectors. If you look at biotech, nanotech, AI, the green economy. And so the degree to which how venture capitalists are being rewarded for their investments is potentially a bit of a free riding issue and has created in some sectors 
uh, uh, parasitic relationships, you know, because they're very exit driven. They want to exit in three years through a buyout or an IPO. But entering these sectors after the government actually invested in some of the really early stage high risk areas, again, just look at the history of nanotech and biotech or fracking even. Fracking was all government financed um, initially. Um, how do we actually create a more symbiotic deal? And space, by the way, space today is the area where I think we should really be questioning what's happening. Novartis today is working for free on the International Space Station and patenting. I'm not sure that that's a very symbiotic deal. What's happening to patenting is incredibly um, problematic. We are today patenting increasingly upstream. So the tools for research, the research itself, the science base is being privatized, whereas patents used to, up until about 20 years ago, be mainly downstream. And that's a governance question. That's a contracts problem, because patents are contracts with the state. You get a you know, 20-year uh, monopoly. Um, and by the way, one of the most exciting private sector labs in innovation, I'm sure you've all heard of Bell Labs. Um, have you read the Ideas Factory? Great book. Bell Labs actually came from uh, government thinking at the time that they had to get a return for giving monopoly power to a company, which was AT&T. AT&T had a monopoly, not given by God, but by the government. And the government said, well, you know what? You've got to reinvest your profits in order to retain this uh, monopoly. We want you to reinvest in an innovation, and in big innovation beyond telecoms. And they said yes. And if you ask yourself today, you know, we have record level hoarding in the US, um, $2 trillion being hoarded in the US, over 2 trillion euros in uh, Europe, over $3 trillion uh, of share buybacks in the last 10 years in the Fortune 500 companies. This kind of unlocked capital could actually become, if you want, a condition for access, actually, to these really ambitious public programs. Again, you know, I already mentioned internet GPS, but Google's algorithm was funded publicly, um, which doesn't mean that's bad. I think that's all really good. But then how do you structure these partnerships in such a way that actually leads to a public return in that wider sense, which could be also equity? I mean, Tesla, sorry, I, I could go on and on, but Elon Musk got $5 billion from the US government and never said thank you. I mean, that's my main thing as a mother. I'm like, did you say thank you? <laughs> um, but Tesla, in particular, got $465 million in a guaranteed loan. Solyndra, as you all know, because most people know the Solyndra story, got just a bit more. And Obama, even though he had all these Goldman Sachs, that's the third time I mentioned Goldman Sachs, uh, guys in government, he said the opposite of what I'm sure they would have said with their investments. They said, oh, if you don't pay back the loan, we get 3 million shares in your company. It's like, why would you want 3 million shares in a crappy company that doesn't pay back the loan? Had he said the opposite, if you pay back the loan, we get 3 million shares in your company. The price per share when Tesla got the loan in 2009 was $9. When they paid it back 2013, it was 90. That difference multiplied by 3 million would have more than paid back the Solyndra loss and the next round of investment. But that requires us to think of government, again, as a co-creator, as an investor of first resort, not just fixing, enabling, mending, you know, facilitating, de-risking, but actually co-creating markets and also putting them then in a position to also when we talk about the privacy question, GDPR, the Facebook challenge that everyone's been talking about recently, not just as intervening ex post, but hey, you know, this is citizens' data, it's public investments that went into the underlying technology. How do we co-shape and co-create the future of digital in a way that actually produces public value? Wonderful. Uh, we just have time for one more quick one here. Uh, have you experienced any negative or defensive reactions from any industries that are exploiting this subjective definition of value? Of course, because there's, I mean, first of all, I get really good reactions. I just met um, a couple weeks ago with Satya Nadella, who had read, well, both books, especially The Entrepreneurial State. Bill Gates also flew me out once to Seattle just to talk about the future of green. He said, yep, you, you know, very well explained what happened in IT. Now we need the same thing to happen in green. It's not happening. But there's also lots of mediocrity <laughs> in business, and there's lots of profits to be made by not talking about this story. So capital gains tax in the US fell by 50% in four years, uh, the end of the 70s. And this coincided with the uh, rise of the National Venture Capital Association, and they, in fact, were the lead lobbyists for that. You know, you want the knowledge economy, innovation economy, reduce my capital gains. And that, you know, Warren Buffett, who's not a communist, has to remind us, I don't even look at that. I look at where there's an opportunity. You know, stop reducing my capital gains tax. It doesn't make a difference to where I invest. Um, and so the real question is, where have these opportunities actually come from? That's where I see my role. But again, you know, by charging these very high prices in the pharmaceutical industry, by being able to do these share buybacks to the extent that they're being done, which of course has a huge effect on distribution as you just saw before, because you know, share buybacks boost stock price, stock options, executive pay, again, the extent to which they're being used. 
um, that, that, you know, there's profits to be made. So people who are, or, and again, the point I made before about the venture capital industry, you know, it's all good and, and fine to say, yes, of course it's true. The NIH is important, DARPA is important, NASA is important, SBIR is important. But what does that then mean for how much you got from those investments compared to how much actually came back to a public purse? And those are difficult sometimes to accept. And so, of course, you get a backlash. And I'm definitely seen as the enemy in many quarters. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Um, OK. But I do think it's a win-win. I think if we accept this and really have a new conversation, it's about fueling the next big wave. Currently, we have a lot of surfers surfing that wave. The mm. wave that drove the past innovation is under threat because of how we talk about value. Mm. Thank you, Mariana. Really appreciate that.